All right. So um, my project is a uh, rapid on-demand evolution of binding proteins against coronavirus. And I thank you all for your support. Um, let me first explain the goals. So kind of the immediate goals are we want to obtain candidate therapeutic binding proteins as well as candidate diagnostic binding proteins to better treat and detect COVID-19. Um, and these are kind of the immediate goals, but the longer term goal um, is to really have this capability of rapidly achieving these goals, these first two goals. And of course, we'll want to rapidly do that for SARS-CoV-19, but also to be prepared to do that for new clades of SARS-CoV-19 and novel coronaviruses, or I suppose novel, novel coronaviruses. <clears throat> okay, so um, this is kind of the summary of the project. Uh, the uh, basis of this project is this uh, evolution system that we have uh, developed in my lab called orthogonal replication or orthorep, where we can now encode in the yeast cells and hopefully many other cell types in the future, um, genes onto a special plasmid that is only replicated by this DNA polymerase, uh, but with very high error rates. And then this will allow what's encoded here to continuously diversify, okay? And what we're doing uh, in this project is we are encoding um, scaffolds that have privilege in binding um, uh, coronavirus targets, such as ACE2, which is the receptor for coronavirus, or nanobodies. Um, and we're displaying them on the surface of the cell. Okay, so now you have these cells that are self-diversifying some protein scaffold, and we're simply going to fax sort for binders and then grow the cells, and then fax sort for binders, grow the cells. And in this way, every time you do this, the new mutations that get you closer and closer to better and better binding will fix, okay? And so the reason this could be um, a very important type of approach is because, you know, the traditional way of doing binding evolution through what many of you might realize here is called yeast display, is that you do the same thing, except you don't have these libraries that are self-diversifying. You have sort of these dead-end libraries, and so anytime you get something with a weak binding affinity, you have to remake a library based on that and go through cycles of this multiple times to improve it. And those rediversification uh, techniques are very time consuming. You have to do that in, in vitro. And you can only get very small library sizes. Um, in addition, if you imagine trying to scale those efforts where you want diversity in your solutions to binding your uh, therapeutic targets, you're also um, at a major disadvantage, okay? So this is basically the, the, uh, the proposal. And so I'll just briefly go through some of the components. So the main component is this orthogonal replication system where we basically have now in the lab um, cells that have a separate replication system that doesn't crosstalk with genomic replication. And the reason we want this second replication system is, as I said, so that we can make it highly error prone. Um, you have to have a isolated replication system, or at least a targeted replication system, if you're going to run really high error rates in a cell. That's because uh, life has evolved to be very complex. Genomes are very large, and therefore, you kind of lock yourself out of mutation rates uh, with that large information content that you must maintain accurately to stay functional. Um, but of course, from the perspective of an individual gene, if you want to explore the sequence space of just one single gene, such as a nanobody or ACE2, um, to do so, you need much higher mutation rates than you would need to explore the sequence space of the entire genome, because that space is larger. And so with orthorep, I think we're basically fundamentally getting into this new territory of mutation rates that we can drive the evolution of individual genes at in vivo. And so in summary, orthorep allows what we call continuous in vivo evolution. Um, now we have our mutation rates at about 100,000 fold above the genomic rate. And in the lab, there's uh, um, new systems that can get, get even higher. And we have no off-target genomic mutagenesis, so the cell is perfectly happy, okay? 
And so we're using OrthoRep in many applications, um, and I'm going to talk about ones that kind of are based on our antibody evolution project, but we also are running continuous enzyme evolution experiments, biosensor gene therapy agents, all sorts of things, and exploring evolutionary uh, pathways um, to uncover some of the fundamentals of protein evolution. Okay, so the basic template, as I explained in the approach, is as follows. Basically, we're going to have some binding protein scaffold encoded on OrthoRep. It will be self-diversifying, and we will sort for binding the target and repeat cycles of this to affinity mature, essentially, what that binding protein uh, is doing. And so here's a summary of all the experiments we're running. The green ones are cases where we've already seen that high affinity is evolving and mutations are fixing. So we started this project before COVID-19 with a bunch of different uh, ideas to exploit the scale of this system for protein binding evolution. And now we are doing it with COVID-19 uh, um, uh, targets. Okay. So I'll give you a quick example of something we did before. This was our COVID-19. This is our first experiment. Uh, here, the thing we're encoding is a nanobody that weakly binds a GPCR, the angiotensin II type 1 receptor. Um, and over multiple rounds of this process, we get the accumulation of new mutations that increase affinity. Here, you see that they increase affinity. And here is a uh, experiment where we show that they are actually binding a confirmation of, GP, of a GPCR in a specific manner. So they're binding the agonist confirmation of the GPCR, okay? Um, now let me get to a couple of uh, preliminary result slides on what we're doing with COVID-19. Um, so uh, here we are starting with a a nanobody library as what we're encoding on OrthoRep. This is a particularly interesting one. It is a computationally designed nanobody library that uses ML on um, the camelid nanobody repertoire to kind of extract the hidden variables behind what makes you know, existing repertoires good. And we basically only sampled 180,000 members of the synthetic library and put it onto OrthoRep. So this is very small as libraries go, but we wanted to see that this computationally designed library could already give you weak binders. This was done in collaboration with Debbie Marks' lab at Harvard Med School. And what we find is that after a couple sorts, so we're already at fax three here, we get binders, and those binders are improving after more sorts. So in these fax, um, charts, uh, what you see is on the y-axis, this is expression, on the x-axis is binding, and basically anything in this quadrant is binding, okay? And so we want to pull the population to the right, all right? And um, you'll see that uh, this is happening. For instance, here it looks like we've selected for a new population that has emerged, and you can see mutations in that population. And then here we're selecting a in another fax where we're using less of the receptor binding domain. The target is the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. So here's 10 nanomolar. And so it's doing its job now at a lower concentration of RBD to force the affinity to increase better. Um, here's another example where not, we're not using uh, this ML design library, but we're using a more traditional library that is a very high, uh, has a very high diversity or, or uh, yeah, diversity, but um, we first uh, pre-enrich for some clones that bind RBD, and we select those clones, and these are weak binders, but then if we take those clones and clone them, put them onto OrthoRep, you can affinity mature and get better binders. So here you see that emergence of a new population that this line is showing, and now we're able to bind lower concentrations of RBD. And this is ongoing because the cycle can occur autonomously. This is another example from a different clone. Same thing's happening, and yet from a different clone. So now we're doing the NGS on the products of these experiments to track what's going on. And we're already seeing uh, mutations that are fixing and emerging. Um, so that's kind of the summary of what we're doing. Um, the next steps are, of course, we want to finish these evolution campaigns. We want to characterize the end products. This will be done in collaboration with Andrew Cruz's lab at Harvard Med School, who we've been working on 
antibody uh, evolution and binding protein evolution for a while now. And then um, in service of this rapid response capability, we will make the self-diversifying yeast libraries available to the community and then start carrying out new experiments as new RBD mutants emerge during the pandemic. We also have this idea with Debbie Marx's group where we're actually going to computationally predict uh, gain of function mutations through a statistical analysis of what's happening both in uh, COVID-19 as well as in just all coronaviruses um, to kind of get a step ahead of what might happen um, in the uh, population. Okay, and then finally, kind of the longer term vision that this all fits into is we're working hard in a related project to turn this a system in one that can be fully autonomous, that doesn't require a fax machine to guide the selection. Instead, we're going to have a yeast culture that basically displays in one half of, or in some of the cells, the target. And when the target is able to bind to a, a protein scaffold that's undergoing hypermutagenesis, it will signal to the cell its survival. Right, so this is really getting to this idea that you can just throw in to a yeast culture. Um, you can essentially immunize a culture of yeast with a, a user selected target, and then it will evolve out a high affinity binding protein. And you can do this at scale. It's a very democratic technology. That's the idea. So you can imagine in the future um, when a new pandemic hits, if and when, but when, uh, you can you know, this many labs, any lab with a molecular biology capability can start building their own binding proteins in a rapid time frame. And with that, uh, I'll thank the people uh, involved. These are our collaborators down here. Um, and this has been really led by the heroic efforts of Dr. Alan Wellner. He's the big guy here. Um, and a uh, 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 master student in the lab, uh, Jay Poe. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have time for just one or two questions. So I have a question. This is Eric Perlman. Hi. Um, really fascinating work. Um, I was wondering if you had any any plans, Chang, to uh, to test and see if these actually these nanobodies, the high affinity binding nanobodies, actually yeah. have any um, any neutralizing activity on the virus itself. If you'd be working. Yes, we plan. Yeah. Yes, we plan definitely, and we plan to do that. So. Uh, we're not done with the affinity maturation experiments, but, but once we are, um, we have the pipeline set up to do that. And, okay. you know, I'm hopeful because the, um, the RBD is a pretty small component. And so I think generally we've observed from monoclonals and also from uh, uh, vaccine studies that, um, you know, anything, anything that binds the RBD will be somewhat neutralizing and potentially, um, uh, you know, very effectively neutralizing. Well, given um, the people who are using, yeah. using uh, serum or trying to use serum, there are several um, right. studies using that just now. This would sound like a much better option. Uh, yeah, so. Body, which is more specific and there's going to be less, of, less likelihood of side effects. Yeah, uh, that, that's one of the hopes. I mean, the, there's a pretty defined pipeline on how you can turn an antibody into a therapeutic protein. I mean, an antibody is an antibody, but it's much smaller. You fuse it to a um, FC domain, IgG domain, and then um, that becomes the agent that can actually be delivered. One of the other things that we're kind of excited about in this project is, you know, uh, if there is sequence to be explored or mutational paths that can lead to very, very effective binders, very uh, high affinity binders. Um, we should be able to uncover them just by re repeating the cycle beyond what people uh, will typically give up on if they're using old fashioned methods, right? And so there, there's kind of a diagnostic um, uh, uh, potential because if you want to detect low concentration of coronavirus, you need a much higher affinity than you might want even for a therapeutic. Yeah, so, so those are definitely like in the pipeline of what we will um, uh, uh, try to figure out with these nanobodies we're evolving. 